SQL DB to you. So a quick introduction. My name is Vish. I'm a systems engineer with Confluent, uh, helping evangelize Kafka to a lot of the technology and uh, companies and other companies in various verticals. Uh, before this, I spent a lot of time uh, at another integration company working on APIs and um, connectors. So I've been in the middleware space for about 10 years now. Uh, so from an agenda perspective, um, I want to start with, you know, Mahesh stole a little bit of my thunder. I want to like first talk a little bit about why Kafka, why it exists, what problem does it solve. Uh, then we'll really look at the how. So I want to go very, um, not too deep, but just at a very high level, give a little bit of introduction of, you know, Kafka basics, really. And then we'll uh, look into stream processing, and finally I'll have a bunch of time for Q&A. So I know I'm between you and lunch, so I'll try to make sure I wrap up on time. Uh, so firstly, why uh, event streaming? Why is this important and why now? So uh, traditionally, there was like two ways of you know, processing data. So you could like, you know, move data using and connect it to applications using either ETL products, and this worked really well in processing large batches and volumes of data. Uh, but what it really did was take, extract that data, transform it, and then load it somewhere. And by the time you actually look at the data, it gives you a retroactive view of what happened in the world. And then you had messaging products, which allowed you to uh, process these messages as they were arriving. So in real time, in a very low latency fashion, you were able to process these messages. But these messages are processed in isolation in only that one specific message, and you don't have a historical context of what that message is really about. So what Kafka aims to solve is kind of really bring these two worlds together. So you kind of have really, are able to handle a really high throughput like an ETL system, but are able to process those messages in real time in a low latency fashion like a messaging system. Uh, and the other big motivation for this is really the world is changing. So you see like events everywhere today. So before, if you used to make a phone call to a friend, you had to like catch up on everything that happened since your last phone call. Now that's no longer the case. Now when you call someone, you know exactly where they are, what they've been eating, everything's like you have a live access uh, feed on Instagram. Uh, newspapers, another great example. I used to, you know, grow up love reading newspapers in the morning to really catch up on the whole world uh, issues. Now you can like set up like, you know, Google alerts and trends and Twitter notifications on your favorite, you know, sports team or your favorite, um, you know, uh, game uh, to be notified as and when they happen. And now this is en entering the enterprise as well. You see systems, um, you know, from, go you know, companies going from like systems like email to Slack, where now you get like real time notifications, you're able to go and consume these messages as and when they happen. So events are everywhere. So um, the first thing I want to like make sure that you understand is the difference between an event and a message. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's very subtle, but it's very important to know that an event is really nothing but a combination of a notification and a state change. And it's important to understand this. It also happens to be immutable, which we'll look at, that you can't go and change an event. So like I'm speaking right now, I can't go back and take my words. Um, whereas with a message, that's not the case. When you write a message, you have an explicit expectation of what's going to happen with that message, who's going to consume that message, uh, what they're going to do with it, when they're going to acknowledge back, etc. So uh, today I'll be focusing just on events and speaking uh, about events. Um, the big realization the founders of Confluent had when they were at LinkedIn and created Kafka was uh, really understanding that events hold way more interesting information than the state themselves. So for example, I can say like I changed my job from my prior state to current state at this particular time. This has a lot more context, a lot more meaning as opposed to just saying where I work today. Um, and the big realization that they also had was, although there was so much context and uh, valuable information in these events, there was no real data storage for events. You know, Hadoop has like file system, a database has like a table, but for events, there was really like no place to put these events except like logs where, and these logs were like really hidden somewhere and not accessible to everyone. So that was really the genesis or creation of uh, Kafka. So. Um, the big uh, advantage of using and using like events is it lets you other applications interpret these events in various different ways. So for example, that same job change event can be in interpreted in three different ways by, for example, an email service that could stop sending uh, job uh, 
notifications. You could have a recommendation engine that stops suggesting certain kinds of jobs. Uh, or you could have a search engine that you know, gives or suggests various other kinds of jobs. So each of these are interpreting that event in different ways. And that's basically what an event-based system allows you to like, uh, develop. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, um, as we are all developing software today, the first thing you need to keep in mind is the user of software nowadays is not just an end user that's sitting behind a UI and accessing this data. The user of software now is growingly other software. So in this world of, you know, every time every application that you build today needs some kind of API, some kind of connectivity for other systems to talk to it. So the first thing you need to keep in mind is in this day and age, like when you're designing a system, does it really have to be synchronous? Do you really need a user sitting there waiting for like their request and response to be like processed? Or can this all be done in an asynchronous fashion generating events? And software doesn't have like a limited attention span. Software can, you know, process various number of events in uh, real time. So that's kind of really the why. Uh, and what this lets you do is lets you enable uh, rich context-driven experiences for your customers, our employees, if you're developing internal tools. Um, so this is a customer uh, lift um, that uh, uses like Kafka heavily. Uh, and this applies to also other ride-sharing platforms like Uber and Ola. Um, so what they're able to do is take like real time information and combine it with historical data to give you like a very accurate ETA of when your ride is going to arrive. So if you're using just a messaging system, uh, this will still give you uh, an indication of where your driver is. So you can say like they're three kilometers away, but uh, three kilometers in Bangalore is very different from three kilometers in like outskirts of Pune, right? So this is, uh, as I realized in the last couple of days, so this is, uh, you know, it's giving you a little bit of information, but it's not really that useful to your customers. Whereas if you use an event streaming platform, what this lets you do is take that geolocation of the driver, be able to correlate that with historical traffic data, look at other parameters like history of the driver, is it a fast driver, slow driver? So they have like 100 different parameters that they use to be able to give you a very accurate ET of when your uh, ride is gonna arrive. So it's very mission critical to their business, and their entire uh, operation runs on being able to like, react to these events as they're happening, not at a later point of time. Uh, and this is not just for uh, systems that are giving you those feedback in like, real time. So this is uh, Capital One is a big bank in the US that uses event streams to, uh, and stream processing to do a bunch of different things, like fraud notifications and alerting your users when they detect these like, fraud transactions. Uh, one of my favorite apps is this thing that they've built called a second look. So if you see a same transaction uh, at the same vendor, like same um, amount uh, in that transaction, uh, it gives you a notification. Like, hey, did you swipe your card twice by mistake? Or was this really like you buying two burgers at McDonald's one after the other? So it kind of like gives you this information right as, as and when it's happening. And then other things like you know, automated transaction analysis to be able to like, process this data in real time. So these are just some examples of what you can do with an event streaming platform. Um, so I'll, you know, various part of this talk, I'm going to give a bunch of takeaways, and I'll summarize all this at the end. So the first thing I want you to remember is an event streaming platform really lets you build what, you know, what's known as contextual event-driven applications. And this is only possible if you can take real-time data and combine it with historical data. You don't use two different tools for using real-time and historical data. So um, I spoke about an event streaming platform. So now let's look at the how a little bit. And let's look at the capabilities of you know, what are some of the things this lets you do. Uh, so the first thing is publish and subscribe to events. This is pretty basic. Like you know, If you have events, you should be able to access those events. You should be able to write events, right? Um, but the other two things are pretty important. So the first thing is storing events. So this is the first thing if you're using Kafka, and thanks to Mahesh for doing the poll. I know a lot of you are very familiar with Kafka. But the first thing that if you're coming from a messaging background to Kafka, you'll know and understand is Kafka actually stores these messages. It persists these messages. They're written to disk. And it's, it's a key differentiating factor for using Kafka as opposed to other messaging products. Uh, and then we'll look at the processing in much more detail and all the different ways you can do this. Um, so I'll, 
I'll give a little bit of overview. I know a lot of you are very familiar with Kafka, but I'll just go very quickly through this, spend about like five minutes so everyone has a level set understanding of what Kafka is. So at its core, Kafka is a commit log. So if you're an engineer, you probably know what a log is, but it's, it basically allows you to append data at the end of the log. So you can't like go and say, like I want eight to be overriding four. That's not something Kafka allows you to do. So you always append data in the end of the log. So by definition, when you're writing data, it's immutable. So you can't like go and update state for it. Uh, but this does not apply to consumers. So consumers can go and read from anywhere in the log. So they use this thing called an offset to keep track of where they have read and how much they've read. So system A could be like a batch ETL process that says give me all the events in, that happened in the log for this particular user. You could have a system B that's always up to date with events as and when they're happening. So it really gives the onus to the consumer to be able to process the events as and when they're happening. Um, Mahesh mentioned this briefly. I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more detail, but not too much. So there are three things to consider. So there's a producer that writes data into Kafka. There's a consumer that consumes these messages off of Kafka. And the data itself is stored in something called partitions. And partitions are very fundamental to Kafka because that's how uh, elasticity is achieved, that's how scalability is achieved, that's how fault tolerance is achieved. So everything like is really the most fundamental unit for Kafka is a partition. Uh, a topic is nothing but a logical grouping of partition that holds the similar event type. So a topic is something really just for humans to uh, understand what kind of data you're dealing with, but partitions are really what the machines understand. So as you see here, you have like one topic that has two partitions, and those two partitions are then have like three replicas each. So these can then be distributed across various servers, what's called brokers in Kafka. And uh, what this allows you to do is uh, have both scalability as well as like fault tolerance. So for example, if broker two goes down, there is a copy of this partition on two other machines. So you can like recover and make sure that there's no data loss whatsoever. Um, and this is kind of like pretty fundamental in how the data is like actually stored. It's written on disk. And uh, if you're interested, you can go read a little bit more about how Kafka leverages the page cache very heavily. And that's also very fundamental to why the interbroker communication is so fast. It uses something called a page cache network socket. And this makes sure that data that's being replicated is done in a very fast and seamless manner. All right, so very quickly looking into how you produce data into Kafka. So the first thing to understand is data, again, is written to the end of the log. But now this log itself has like four different partitions, right? So there's four partitions. Now you want to write data uh, at the end of each. So data is, if you don't uh, specify anything, it automatically, Kafka does this for you. It does this in a round robin manner. So it will go and distribute data evenly. So data is always written to something known as the leader of the partition. So for example, in this uh, scenario over here, so this could be elected as the leader for partition one. These two are just replicas. So data will always be written here first. Uh, the other thing to remember is partitions also allow you to, when you're producing to Kafka, like the important thing to remember is partitions allow you to like actually make sure that similar event types are written to the same partition because Kafka guarantees orders only within a partition. It doesn't guarantee orders across partitions. So if you want order guarantees, you have to make sure that this is always, the data that you're producing always goes to the same uh, partition. So how do you do that? You use something called a key. So every message written to Kafka consists of three things. So there's a key, a message, and a timestamp. So you can leverage the key for something that's domain specific uh, to you, something like a user ID or a device ID if you have like IoT data. And that will ensure that all the users' uh, events or all those devices' events go into that same partition. So you, that way, when you read from that particular partition, you are preserving the order. You're not reading across different partitions. Uh, and then when you're consuming from Kafka, you have a client that can consume from all the partitions at once. So as I mentioned, this, will, this is scalable, but it ensures that you, know, you might read data that's written afterward before you've read this data. So if you want to read like, uh, data in that exact specific order, you'll have to uh, make sure that data goes into that same partition. Um, partitions are also a good way to like scale your uh, application. So typically when you're reading or consuming data from Kafka, 
you're almost always limited by the network bandwidth. It's really how fast can you uh, read this information. Because Kafka allows you to like, create multiple consumers. So you can have multiple consumers each reading off of this particular partition. And then you, can, um, you could have scenarios where you don't want that same data to be read by both these consumers. right? So then you create something called a consumer group. And what this ensures is it reads the data and automatically like, load balances across various consumers. So this will ensure that this partition is read by only one consumer, not another consumer, so you don't have duplicates. But if this consumer itself goes down, this partition will automatically be reassigned to another consumer within that same consumer group. Um, and it's, uh, you can almost think of a consumer group as like a logical name, just like a topic is a logical name for partitions. Consumer groups are logical groupings of various consumers. Um, and then obviously you can have multiple consumer groups. So this allows you to have that same data read by multiple applications. So typically if you have an ETL system and uh, another real-time application, they both correlate to something like a consumer group. Uh, and then there's also this special consumer group of like one consumer group with only one consumer. So that kind of like gives you a little bit of benefits of both. Uh, and consumer groups are also like very important to understand in Kafka if you're coming from like a messaging background. Because if you put consumers within a consumer group, uh, that mimics very much like a message queue. So it scales and works exactly like a message queue. But if you have different consumer groups, that works more like a published subscribe system. So it's, it's, a, it's a slight nuance, but very important to understand how Kafka can be uh, applicable to all these different kind of use cases. Uh, and then finally, there's uh, delivery guarantees in, as a producer and as a consumer. So as a producer, you get to select when you want the acknowledgment back from Kafka. So you can say acts equal to zero. So that works in like a fire and forget manner that, you know, you don't really care if the data has been written or not. Um, acts equal to one will ensure that at least the leader gets that message. The leader can then replicate into the other partitions as and when they need it. But you get an acknowledgment back as soon as the leader has the data. And then acts equal to all will wait until the data has been replicated to all your different partitions. So this is probably very important if durability is important to you, but uh, it would. Uh, take a hit on latency, because now your producer is waiting until all the partitions have the data. Uh, similarly, uh, a consumer has a certain set of guarantees as well. So you, when you pick a message, you can say, I want to process this message at least once, uh, at most once, or exactly once. So as the name suggests, so if you pick a message at least once, that will make sure that you don't have like, any duplicates, uh, or you'll make sure that you always like, process the data, that you don't drop any data. Uh, at most once is useful in cases where your consuming application is not item potent. So uh, what I mean by that is if you're reading data from Kafka and writing it into uh, SAP and generating invoices, you don't want to duplicate million dollar invoice, right? You don't want to pay someone uh, twice. So in that case, you want to make sure you use something like at most once. So that message that's being read will be read at most once. It could be zero, but you won't have any duplicates whatsoever. Uh, exactly once is kind of like the holy grail. It's the best of both, but there are certain things you have to do to be able to design to exactly once, so it's a little more complex, but it is possible, and there's a lot of customers using exactly once, both for processing as well as uh, within their applications themselves. So that's a very high-level uh, overview of Kafka. There's, again, a lot more that I didn't go over. So hopefully this got you a little interested in Kafka if you weren't familiar. Uh, there's like the, as I said, the natural thing to like read about next is really like um, the the page cache and uh, the internal fundamentals of Kafka. Uh, you can also like read up on things like um, log compaction because that's that's pretty uh, interesting as well on how Kafka like um, is able to like store this information and then you can um, you know drop some of this information uh, and then. Um, one other thing I didn't cover, which might be of interest, is like how client quotas and ACLs work. So that's, that's also something that uh, I usually go through in more detail. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip into uh, the stream processing aspect. So the second takeaway I want you to have from here is not only can you publish and subscribe to events, but you can actually store these events. Kafka actually stores and persists all events as it's flowing through Kafka. All right, now let's get to the fun part of processing the events. So you saw you can like publish and subscribe to them. You saw you, how you can store them. 
So now let's see how you can like process and analyze them in real time. So there's really like, uh, oh, so this is a good analogy I like to use. So just to think of like stream processing. Um, so if you're familiar with Unix or Linux, you probably know what like Unix pipes are. So Kafka topics work very much like Unix pipes. So if you were to think of getting data in, of the, in and out of these pipes, that's what Kafka Connect is. Kafka Connect is an easy way for you to get data in and out of these pipes. But then you still need to do something with the data, right? You're not just moving bytes around. You're, in this case, you're like doing a search, you're doing a transform. And that's basically what stream processing is. It allows you to actually work on the data as and when it's going through Kafka. And then also allow you to like put this information back into Kafka for others to consume. So you can like take the output of one and then pipe it into the as an input to the next one. Um, so there's two ways in which you can do uh, stream processing in Kafka. So the first one is Kafka Streams. Uh, what this is is a Java SDK or a library that you embed directly into your applications. So there's no separate processing cluster. So this is embedded directly into your systems, and this allows you to do complex, um, you know, stateful and stateless stream processing. So what I mean by that is stateful is usually things like aggregate or you know joins where you need to actually remember and maintain state. Uh, and stateless is things like filters. So for example, if you, as these like, events are coming through, if you just want to do like, a filter and see if that probability is greater than 0 0.8, you can do that in real time using Kafka Streams. The same thing can also be done through KSQL, which is a streaming SQL engine for Kafka. Uh, this is really a SQL interface that sits on top of Kafka Streams. And, uh, a, you, and what this does is it really lowers the barrier of entry within your organization to do stream processing. So if you're not a Java developer, you can still use KSQL if you're familiar with uh, SQL syntaxes. And you can do the same thing that you did in like 15 lines of code. You can do it in a simple select statement and create streams and tables very easily. Um, and this is a, a way to like think of how one is based on the other. So you have like Kafka, and then it has the raw producer and consumer APIs, on top of which a lot of the best practices for processing is built into Kafka Streams. And then the highest abstraction layer is KSQL that sits on top of Kafka Streams, allowing you to do the same kind of stream processing that you would in Kafka Streams. Um, so as you see, it kind of like gets easier to use as you go up the stack, but your flexibility reduces. So you might run into a certain function that doesn't exist in KSQL, in which case you'd have to actually go into the code and write Kafka Streams applications. All right, so let's uh, go into this in a little more detail and really understand what processing and stream processing is about. So when, when, when we looked at the log and we looked at how Kafka stores it, that's purely at the storage layer on the brokers. So the data that's written into these like, topics and partitions is purely bytes. It's like a raw byte array. It's zeros and ones. It's not something that you can like, do anything with, let alone like, you know, understand what it is and process it. So to be able to do this, there's this processing layer of uh, Kafka streams built on top of uh, this. And the first thing to understand is both of these have this notion of a stream and a table. Again, the word stream is kind of uh, confusing with Kafka streams, so these are two separate constructs. So even KSQL has a stream and a table. So the first thing to think of when you're thinking of a stream is really being able to interpret uh, this data. So uh, what it is is nothing but a topic with a schema that allows you to like serialize and deserialize the data that's w within that topic. So now you know that raw byte of information was really like Alice and Bob and the three cities that they've been to. Um, this may be sufficient for most cases if you are able to like handle all this information in real time. But there's also an aggregated view of this. It's called a table. And this table in Kafka is very different from tables in relational databases. Uh, if you're coming from like a database background, a, a Kafka table almost acts more like a materialized view as opposed to a table. Because what Kafka tables are, are uh, basically you don't change these tables. These tables use like a compacted topic underneath. And basically based on when those changes are made to the topic, that is aggregated and shown to you over there that you can uh, query and look up. So um, let's see when to use which. So uh, as I mentioned, streams record 
all your history. So all transactions are recorded. So this is, for example, if I've, it's like a ledger of all the different sales that I've done. So this, is, uh, this will store each and every one as, as and when they're happening. Uh, tables actually persist state. So they actually store uh, an aggregated view of this information. So it could be just like my running sales total, or it could be one of these is like done in California, so it updates the California sales totals, for example. Um, another example that might make it more relevant, this, this was one that really resonated with me, to understand the fine difference between a stream and a table. So a stream is really like a stream of all the sequence of different moves that you've done. And then a table is like the state of the current board. So uh, there's this interesting duality between a stream and a table where you can't just change the state of a board without actually doing a, creating a move. So there's this, every change that uh, you make into a stream actually uh, you know, is represented in, in the table itself. Uh, and also, if you're into behavioral psychology, I'm a big Kahneman fan and been reading about this. So this is another way, if you're, especially if you're developing consumer applications, you can think of it this way. So there's an experiencing self and a remembering self. So if you go to a two-hour concert, you're spending the entire two hours over there. But what do you remember? You don't remember all the two hours, right? So there's like a finite set of things you remember. So that's typically like what, what these like tables will store if you're developing a consumer-based application. Um, so uh, finally, one last thing about streams and tables. So uh, remember I mentioned uh, topics and uh, data that's stored in Kafka is stored in partitions for scalability. So just like the storage is partitioned, uh, the processing is also partitioned. So there is this like unit of parallelism in Kafka streams called a stream task. And there's basically a one-to-one -one, um, uh, mapping between like a stream and a partition. So as you like add more partitions, you can like scale the number of streams in your applications as well. Uh, tables work slightly differently. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's really more like a materialized view as opposed to like a table. Um, and usually the topic for for 99 percent of the time, I, I use the word usually, but for most times, it's uh, the underlying topic is a compacted topic. And uh, at a, very quickly, what a compacted topic is, is um, if you have a key and value, and you, the same key has like multiple values, you only store the latest key and the value. You pretty much like drop all the other older values for that particular key. So this is super important uh, um, in certain use cases. Like for example, if you have like bank balances, you just, for a particular user ID, you just want to see what their latest value is. You don't need an entire history of how their bank balance has changed over a period of time. So that's typically the information that you would store in something like tables. Uh, and without going into too much detail on this, so every table has its own uh, state store. So uh, Kafka uses something uh, called a state store, which is nothing but a key, lightweight key value database. And that's where the state is actually written into. And the important thing to keep in mind is that state store is not something you have to like worry about. It's really an abstraction. So if you lose the state store, it can be recreated from the underlying topic. So you don't have to really worry about maintaining the state store and dealing with that. So um, the big takeaway I want you to have from this is there's two ways in which you can process data, right? So you have to like decide which one is more applicable for your specific use cases and your specific organization. Um, and it's totally fine to mix and match. You can use Kafka streams for certain use cases, case SQL for other sets of use cases. And we looked at how both of these have this concept of a stream and a table. So how you can store data in both a stream and a table and how it processes this information as it's flowing through Kafka. All right, so now um, let's move to case SQL uh, DB. So, um, we looked at case SQL and saw some of the use cases it allows you to do. So here's some more use cases where case SQL is heavily used in production. So it's very common to use in uh, real-time monitoring. So if you have like SIM use cases or intrusion detection use cases uh, at a network-based company uh, processing like sensor data, it's as simple as reading from syslog, ingesting from syslog into uh, Kafka, and then writing like a where clause like this. So it really allows you to do like very powerful uh, things um, using simple SQL syntax. Uh, it's also very commonly used for anomaly detection, fraud detection. Uh, these are, again, great use cases for case SQL. 
Um, in this example, uh, I'm using something called a, a window, which is, acts like a sliding window if you use like, complex event processing. Um, and what this query is really doing is checking if I've swiped my card more than three times in a five second window. And if you have done that, it takes that authorization that you've made and creates a possible fraud um, table. In the prior example, we created a stream. In this case, we're creating a table and storing that information into um, a table called possible fraud. So keep in mind, again, we're not like modifying the original topic or the stream over here. So this authorization attempts, if someone wants to go and read all the authorization attempts, they can. But if someone wants to consume just the um, possible fraud uh, transactions, they can like go and read this particular table. Uh, and it's also really good for streaming ETL. So if you're trying to do like lookups, joins, aggregates, it's again a really good way to be able to do all this in real time. So now you're doing a join for users and trying to like figure out which one of these are platinum and then you can show a specific uh, advertisement for them, for example. So what is it not good for? So KSQL, uh, by definition, is again, it's a stream processing technology or it's a a stream processing engine. So it's not good for uh, ad hoc queries in that you can't just, so there's no indexes in KSQL like a database. So like for example, if your events that you've written have like a user ID inside of the message and you wanna like do a search of, you know, give me all the information for that user ID, I want to index it on user ID, that's not something you can do. You have to ensure that you have used that user ID as the key right at the beginning. Uh, and then typically uh, there's this retention factor. Uh, Mahesh mentioned the New York Times example. People are storing data for longer and longer periods of time in Kafka, but this is not always the case. A lot of times people use Kafka, just publish and subscribe. So if you don't have the data, then it's very hard for you to like, use KSQL. Uh, and then it's also not good for integrating with other BI tools. And the main reason for this is most of these like, tools like Tableau and MicroStrategy are not able to actually understand like, continuously updating results and streams of data. They really view, as, view it as like, static data. So this is something that will change. There will be, like, at some point, like, JDBC options, or they'll be able to like, support like, uh, live streaming updating dashboards. So, um, so what, what, where KSQL is evolving into KSQL DB is being uh, able to like, allow you to actually do some of these like, queries, and specifically pull queries. So for example, if your application has to like, read someone's credit score, and you're getting like, the stream of events, and you know, let's say there are three events, right? So, and this person's like, um, uh, credit score has changed uh, in these three values, but you don't really care for the entire history. You don't really need to know like when it's, it's over 700, when it's less. You really only care for like what Jay's current credit score is. So, if you want to like access this information, there was no easy way to do this before. But now, KSQL uh, is changing into KSQL DB and allowing you to actually do these like pull queries. So basically, you have both options. So you can do push queries. So you just say you want to emit changes. And this will give you all the prior um, credit scores. Or you can just say, like, for this specific row key, just give me the current credit score. So this is really acting more like a point in time lookup for you to be able to like, actually get that information out of, uh, out of Kafka. Yeah, so that's a uh, good question. Yeah, so, so the question was, uh, if you're doing a select, it's always a pull query. So, so the, the answer is yes and no. So it is, it is also, so basically in KSQL, when you do a query, it's a continuously running query. It's not a query that actually like terminates and gives you results. It is a continuously running query that gives uh, events, late arriving events, and events as and when they're happening. So there's this internal joke at Confluent. We say um, KSQL is like a database admin's like worst nightmare because it's a query that never ends. Because this query is, is always running. So if, if there is like a fourth new credit score over here, that will be updated in the query. So you don't get like three and you're done. So that's basically what pull queries are letting you do. So pull queries will allow you to actually get that information and stop right there.
Yeah, you're just pulling the data, but yeah, so I think there's like a little confusion on push versus pull. Push is not pushing to an external system. It's just getting the data in, getting all the changes right there. Those changes are being pushed to your query. In this case, you are actively like doing a point in time lookup for that specific value. Yeah, you could think of it that way. So you could think of this as like a continuously stream of events, and this is like a point in time lookup. So that's uh, exactly what I was going to like summarize it with. Is it's a point in time lookup of that information. So you basically do uh, a query, and you kind of like get that information, and it's very sim similar to how regular JDBC and Select uh, in SQL works. Um, the other thing that KSQL DB has added and introduced is embedded connectors. So if you use Kafka Connect, you'll know that you always uh, can like pull information from various systems into Kafka very easily. Now you can do it all within the same SQL syntax. So as you're writing your KSQL queries, you can also say like bring in information from Splunk or Sumo Logic or any one of these like connectors. So you can look at Confluent Hub to see a list of all the open source connectors as well as uh, enterprise connectors that are available. So, um, so what I want you to like take away from this is you're probably wondering what is KSQL DB? Is it going to like replace my database today? So short answer is no. It does not replace any traditional databases. And what I want you to think of is really like what is a database? So if you think of a database, it's uh, you might think it like actually stores the data in a table, but it doesn't. It actually the raw storage is a processing log, like it's it's a commit log. So that's why if you lose your uh, database, you ca you're able to like retrieve it back because you replay everything that's in that log, and you're able to recreate all your tables, right? So what a table really is then is you're basically what you're doing is materializing these events into a very specific structure. So then you get the advantage of SQL. So you're taking that uh, information from that commit log, taking a subset of it, putting it into a table, and making it accessible to others. Or Put another way, there is this notion of like passive data versus active data. So until you query data, data is just sitting like passively in that database, right? It's only when you query it becomes active. So same thing, what, when we query using like KSQL DB, what we're doing is we're querying the state that was produced by the raw commit log, which in this case happens to be Kafka, and we're just recreating like materialized views and materialized caches. So to summarize, uh, you, where you want to like use KSQL DB is typically when you're like building and serving materialized views within your application. Um, this is also useful um, for other KSQL examples. We looked at when you're doing joins against like streams and you know triggers based on events that uh, happen, and then um, also like real time like streaming ETL, right? So that those all continue to be like great use cases for KSQL and. Uh, KSQL DB. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and summarize um, the four things we spoke about today, where we looked at. So the first thing we saw was like there's an event streaming platform that allows you to do two things. So take real-time information and combine that with uh, historical um, context so you can like develop these contextual event-driven applications. Uh, the next thing we saw was how data is actually stored in uh, Kafka and what the storage layer looks like. So it's not just a published subscribe system. It also allows you to like store them and then process them. Uh, and then we saw like two ways in which you can process this data. So there's Kafka Streams, which is a Java-based um, SDK. There's KSQL, which is a SQL-like interface built on top of Kafka Streams. And each of them support two notions. There's a stream and there's a table based on what kind of data that you're actually accessing. Uh, and then finally, we looked at KSQL DB, which makes it super easy for you to um, build materialized views and access this um, within your applications. So with that, I'll say thank you. I'm happy to answer questions at this point. But my email's here. Feel free to like, send me an email at any point if you have any questions. But I also want to like, point out a few other things. So there's a community Slack. I know the, the font's a little messed up. But please join the community Slack. There's a lot of uh, you know, developer evangelists and um, 
engineers from Confluent actively looking at this community Slack and answering questions where you can like share ideas and ask uh, any, any questions, whether you're just getting started or running Kafka at scale. Uh, and then there's like two microsites over here. So if you're looking to like learn Kafka, there's um, uh, kafkatutorials.confluent.io. And then KSQL DB has its own. It's, uh, if you can't read, it's KSQL DB.io. So it's a very good step-by-step -step introduction to KSQL DB. There's a lot of examples. You can download Docker containers and demos and try it out yourself as well. So thank you. I'll take questions at this point. Yeah, so, so the question was, uh, what's the big difference between KSQL and KSQL DB? So KSQL DB is nothing but everything in KSQL but plus these two things. So now you have pull queries, which are a point in time lookup that's new and that's added. And this allows you to cater to a very specific kind of use case. And then embedded connectors are something that's new in KSQL DB. Uh, does embedded connectors provide exactly one's guarantees? Uh, I'll have to double check that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So typically with connectors, uh, some connectors do. It's really dependent on the connectors themselves. Not every connector supports exactly once. So that, that is something I can check and get, get back to you on. I, I didn't completely follow. So, so you said there's an. In Yeah, so, so the question was like, is this state managed in memory, right? So yeah, so, so Kafka uses this thing called RocksDB. So it's a, it's a lightweight uh, uh, key value database. So that's where the state is maintained. So that is in itself uh, what, what's called a state store. And tables are created from that state store. So when you're querying a table, you're actually like uh, querying that state store. And the, the, as I mentioned before, the important thing to keep in mind is all that is uh, funneled through like an underlying Kafka topic. So that way, if you lose the state store, you don't have to like worry about recreating it. So it's a good way to like store the state, but at the same time, you don't have to worry about state management itself. You don't have to like worry about like creating like duplicate RocksDB instances and all those things. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you can pull in data from any database into Kafka, but the, the internal database that Kafka itself uses is you, you can't configure or change that. So that is, that is not configurable. But if you have data sitting in um, Oracle or Postgres, you can easily get data in and out. So there's uh, Kafka Connect, which actually uh, you can do it in KSQL DB using this embedded connector syntax. But Kafka Connect is basically this framework that allows you to connect to other applications and both get data into Kafka as well as get data out of Kafka. No, no, you cannot. That's that's not an option. Yeah. So contextual. So so what I mean is like if you get a single message at a time, you won't have like history of that message or what that message really means. Yeah. So so. So that is like your message, right? So you get latitude and longitude. But using that, you cannot predict how long you're gonna, that cab is going to arrive. For that, you need to know traffic. You need to know a whole bunch of context around that. So around the driver, you need like a lot of other information to be able to like generate like 
information. So it's basically context is uh, like what's surrounding and what the background or history. You can think of it as a background, really. Yeah, question. What? Yeah, so, so the question was, is there a storage engine that backs the table itself? So yeah, so that is the state store. So Kafka uses a state store called RocksDB. Uh, it was developed at Facebook. It's, uh, it's open source, and uh, there's uh, actively like, used and contributed at, at various companies. Uh, it, it actually, like, uh, it is, uh, I, I believe it also uses the disk. It's not completely in memory, but it is very scalable. It's used at Facebook uh, extensively and a bunch of other companies. Um, yeah, I, you, you can look up RocksDB, so that, that has, like, a lot of information on how, how you, it's, it's key value, basically. Yeah, RocksDB. Yeah, so the question is what are the connectors and wh why they're used? So connectors are basically, so, so there's, um, I didn't talk a lot about Kafka Connect today. So Kafka Connect is a framework that allows you to like connect to external systems and both bring information from them into Kafka, as well as take that information and, from Kafka and push it to other systems. So there is this notion of a source and a sync. So a source is basically reading into Kafka, a sync is pushing it out from Kafka. Uh, and connectors are an abstraction layer on top of Kafka Connect. So everyone is connecting to the same systems like a MySQL database or Elasticsearch or XYZ. So there are a number of different connectors available. So you can look up Confluent Hub. So that's the marketplace where you'll see all these like different connectors. So you can download like, for example, Elasticsearch uh, connector and do a couple of clicks, configure, put in your Elasticsearch URL and you can sync data directly from Kafka into Elasticsearch. So without writing any code, it allows you to read and write information. Yeah, you, so the question is, uh, for KSQL DB, do you still need a separate like connect instance? So, so the answer is uh, no, you do not need a separate like connect cluster. You can upload the jars. You still need the connector itself. You can still upload the jars directly to use within KSQL DB. KSQL, is, is it open source? Yes, it's completely open source. It's, uh, it's available to, uh, so I should, uh, I should modify. It's not open source, it's community licensed. So basically for all intensive purposes, it's open source, but you can't download and offer it as a service to compete with Confluent, so that's why it's community, uh, community licensed. Question. How do you store? Yeah, so how do you store uh, intermediate or transformatory data? So you have two options. So you can either put it back into a separate topic uh, itself, or you can also use Kafka tables. So you can use tables. So one thing I didn't talk about today is there's also a notion of a global Kafka table. So just like these tables uh, are accessible to a certain set of like topics, there's this notion of a global table that you can write like shared context. So all applications can read and write from that particular table. So tables are a common way to like store uh, state and context as you're going through a transaction. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, is there um, is there like a roadmap to like get to like more machine to machine uh, kind of like uh, communication for like stateful stream processing? Uh, yes, we are looking into all those options. Uh, that is, that is, I, I don't know if it's like definitely in the roadmap to do something like that. 
Um, the, the reason like it uses Kafka topics like heavily is because Kafka is again very scalable. So those are topics that are not, uh, they usually are not like uh, prohibitive in terms of like causing any like delays or impacting your throughput or performance because Kafka like, like you shouldn't be afraid of like creating like topics uh, even if it's an intermediate topics. Uh, there's you know use cases at like LinkedIn and Netflix of like how many like you know they have a single cluster that goes into like hundreds of thousands of partitions so that that should not be a concern but yeah that's uh, something I don't know yet of what the roadmap's going to look like. Yeah, that's another good question. So, uh, so the question was, Pulsar has schema registry embedded into the brokers itself. Is there plans for Kafka to do that? Uh, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, we, we definitely looked at uh, that as an option. Um, so r right now there's this uh, schema validation uh, feature that's available in like Confluence Enterprise product where you can actually like conform and make sure that uh, it does validate against the specific schema at the broker level. So that's not something that you have to like go look up schema registry and then do it. You can actually do like a broker side schema validation right now. But that is not an open source component. It is part of Confluence Enterprise uh, platform. All right, one more before, yeah. Okay, I don't know about that. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. So this is we we can chat offline about this. So there there are some some things that are being planned around that um, over there. But we at this point there's no like public statement I can make on this is what we're doing or where it's going to be going. Uh, one thing I will mention is there are like a lot of KSQL like tuning guides so, uh, available uh, on like conference website as well as blogs that talk about how to tune your queries as well as tune, tune the, the engine itself, like when you set up like a KSQL cluster. So those should like um, be able to like take care of like, you know, quotas specifically, like, you know, one query doesn't like uh, eat up like uh, everything and those kind of things should be easily manageable. Yeah, thanks for waiting. Yeah, so it's a good question. So the question was, how does fault tolerance work in KSQL? Um, so basically, uh, KSQL has its own like processing cluster. So you can like set up like multiple clusters that are working in either a standalone mode, so that's a single cluster, or you could have like yes, on top of Kafka. So it will be a different cluster. So it's not on the brokers itself. So you have a separate KSQL cluster. And there you can similarly like scale. You can have a distributed cluster that has like two or three or more nodes, and that will ensure that uh, loads automatically balance between all those uh, different nodes. Cool. So, uh, any last questions before I wrap up?
Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, feel free to find me uh, if you have any other questions. I'll be around for.